uh, fantastic considering the conditions. Uh, and um, I'm so glad because I, I personally find a day like today, the discussion so nourishing where uh, if I'm not voting for a debate, I try to turn off my phone and close the laptop and let my mind walk in some new directions. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's uh, presented so far for some really stimulating discussion. Um, in terms of this panel, we have had two losses due to force majeure type uh, conditions, uh, and we have two replacements. So uh, I, I'm going to divert you a little bit from the program. Uh, to the far left is Ryan Martins, uh, who among other things was the founder of a company called Rally Software that we're going to talk a lot about in this panel called uh, Tech for Good. Uh, to Ryan's right is Ellen uh, Satterwhite. Satterwhite. Yes. Yep. Uh, and uh, got it. Ellen <laughs> was uh, <laughs> Ellen was with the FCC, where she worked on, among other things, broadband initiatives, uh, and now is with the Glen Echo Group. Uh, to her right is Balin Na Nair, uh, who is the CEO and um, CEO and are you chair? What's your yeah, other exalted title? CEO there? is just fine. CEO <laughs> of uh, uh, Liberty CEO of Latin America, and we're going to be uh, leaning on him to talk some about capital and how capital thinks about technology for good, among other things. Uh, to his right um, is, uh, and pitching in, um, thank you uh, to Ann Toth, who you're also going to be hearing from. It's pronounced Toth. 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 Uh, <laughs> Woo! <-hoo>. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hungry in the house, A more yeah. popular pronunciation <laughs> yeah. than what I went with. Thank you for the, the correction. You're going to be hearing from her uh, on the keynote. And then to her right is Rebecca Armagast, who's stepping in for a colleague who could not uh, be here from Philadelphia today. So thanks to our panelists um, for, for joining. In terms of the framing of this discussion, we are charged with talking about technology for good. A few scoping items before we tee up the first question. We agreed that this is a big topic and that we would scope it in this way that um, we will just leave aside the question of should companies be pushing for technology for good and assume a, a, con a set of conditions in which someone is trying to push for technology for good within a company or other organizational context and what might that vision look like. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to start with uh, some visions for technology for good. Um, how many of you are familiar with Rally Software coming into today? All right, so about a quarter uh, of the room. Um, I can say that in 15 years of being involved with the Boulder Denver startup scene, there has not been a company that is more well regarded and more enjoyed by people who work there than, than Rally. Mm -hmm. And credit to Ryan and, and others who are in the leadership there, including Aaron Tram who's here, um, for building a culture that was very intentional about what it did. And Ryan, I'm gonna ask you to start by talking about that and then you've, uh, you've distilled this into a three-part framework that we'll start with in terms of one vision of technology for good, Ryan? Sure, I'll pick it up. Uh, what I think is in kind of the middle, which is uh, I think there's a bigger framing for this technology for good component. Uh, I got to give a little bit of that before we step into the rally story, just because it it sets why would you do this? I, I think uh, um, I, I think to go back to where we were at with a couple of earlier discussions, um, Kevin Kelly's done probably the, one of the better jobs of talking about the role of technology in the world and uh, in his book, What Does Technology Want? Uh, and his argument in, tech, in that book is that it's at least 51% good. And so we're on the 51% the side, even if we didn't make it there in the last question. And some of the things it wants is what we want. It, it wants diversity. It wants complexity. It wants increasing specialization. It wants increasing ubiquity. And in that regard, uh, technology wants good. And the, our big question is how do we amplify that? Uh, Part of coming into this and part of coming into the company that I helped start, there wasn't a, a, lot, a pattern really for that in 2002, 2003. Um, we ended up stumbling our way into a thing called the Entrepreneurs Foundation, started in Silicon Valley. Uh, that Entrepreneurs Foundation ended up finding its way into the Silicon Valley Foundation and actually kind of disappearing. We ended up resurrecting it as a thing called Pledge 1%. Pledge 1% is now an international group that encourages companies to set aside 1% of equity, 1% of time, and 1% of product. 
And in doing so, what I would say, it opens companies up to increasing empathy and understanding of stakeholders. And then I think that's the key recipe that this is all about. Is the, the, um, I think we heard it through the last set of talks, and that is the only path to this direction is to get off the myopic understanding that what businesses are good for is delivering shareholder profits and move on to the concept that the corporate or the business roundtable finally jumped onto after the world of B Corps and Pledge 1% that we exist here is, is something that's for society's benefit too. And that means you have a responsibility from a society and from an environmental standpoint. When you, when you recognize that, uh, things go good. Um, and I, so the three-step framework that Brad was cueing me on was that journey as talked about by many academicians in the world of corporate social responsibility starts typically with tactical volunteering. It has employees in the workforce going out to do things together to, for team building like exercises, using none of their innate skills as business people or engineers other than to paint walls, pick up trash and build fences. Um, and so you'd really be questioned pretty hard as to why would that make technology for good. Uh, what that tends to cause, it tends to cause an understanding of some of the things that are wrong in the communities that you're involved in. It tends to start causing an understanding of how would I be, what's my role in doing this? And if you didn't grow up in a strong faith society or in the Boy Scouts or something where those things were, um, let's say, highly encouraged in your role. and. Uh, that they start to awaken that in you. And the, the second phase of that cycle comes from those employees starting to talk about, hey, this company does something more than just puts out a product that um, creates amazingly <clears throat> sticky uh, usefulness that I can't put down for some reason. Um, and it goes on to use the, to now start using that to those skilled resources to actually do what's called skills-based volunteering. In the world of skills-based volunteering, you actually deploy people from marketing backgrounds to help nonprofits with their marketing um, or technologists with their technology. In that regard, we start to then understand what it is that the company actually has that is the best thing it has to give. And this is not something you would put your finger on, uh, and it's something you have to actually do by, by actually stumbling your way through. We did it through four experiments with five different companies, uh, nonprofits in the area, where we tried all kinds of ways to partner with them and figure out what we had was, that was good. We ended up uh, finding our way into a situation where we helped sponsor the National Civic Day of Hacking in 2014. That was put on by a company called Second Muse, but it also included another company in that regard, and that was Code for America as the nonprofit uh, group involved with that. We ended up getting very involved with Code for America, uh, not only in uh, donating time, um, helping organize volunteer, uh, what they call brigades in cities around the United States where we're involved, and uh, there's a Code for All that represents around the world. But we also ended up giving product away to those brigades. Um, and then it actually helped us enter the, uh, bring our technology into the government entities, which was a later on marketplace for us. In that regard, the notion of our social mission around being able to create entrepreneurs that were more, or engineers that were more empathetic to the societal and environmental problems became a rallying cry around what we did with the Code for America. And it not only drove our volunteering, it drove uh, the creation of why people would join us, amplified our purpose and mission, and allowed us to actually reach more customers more effectively. So it actually wrapped itself around all of our corporate mission. And in that regard, it caused us to think much more diversely about what we were doing um, with a much wider set of stakeholders than uh, just would be our Fortune 5000 or Fortune 2000, Global 2000 customer set. In fact, it caused us to speak at their conferences, but it also caused the Code for America people to speak at, the, at our conferences because that includes some of the largest technology companies in the world where you could then get more and more volunteers that could help you for your mission. The end of that story for me was this year we decided in the state of Colorado to institute the notion of digital services. Um, thanks to the leadership of our administration, we now have a Colorado Digital Services Group, which takes people out of 
uh, their technology roles in companies all around the Front Range, places them in the government for a one-year rotation where they work side by side with other technologists to help bring modern skills into the world of uh, government technology, both on uh, development side as well as uh, um, uh, techno not just technology, but security side. So I, th I think that's an example of a story of how by increasing your understanding of the empathy of all the stakeholders that are involved around you, that you can actually then start to understand, as we said earlier in the morning, the diversity that's available and how to actually um, actually shape your technology towards where it wants to go faster. Right. Uh, I'm going to circle back to Ryan's going to cringe at this uh, because he's uh, not a very egocentric uh, individual, but I'll call that the Martin's bottle for now. We're going to come back to the Martin's model, but I want to okay. get some other uh, visions of technology for good on the table. Rebecca, thanks for stepping in. Talk a little bit about Comcast's effort around the Accelerator program and how that fits. Sure. So the person who was going to come today actually runs the Accelerator pro project and, and could have talked at great length with direct knowledge of it. So I'm going to try to channel her as best I can. Before I get into that and just picking up on, on um, the framework you set up, how I personally think, I'm totally ad just ad hocing here, but <laughs> how I think about the, I, I run global public policy for the company, and how I think about the policy decisions that we need to make are that we need to keep both the country and the company on the leading edge so that we are the place that entrepreneurs want to come. They want to do the cool new stuff that's on the very cutting edge. And at the same time, we want to make sure that the tech that develops from that, the innovation that develops from that, is inclusive and everybody gets to, to um, take advantage of that. So I think on the, the, the more obvious stuff, I think, is on the innovation and the engineers that we have. Um, we're a co company that's across the whole country, so we are in little um, cities around the, the full um, United States. And so folks are very integrated into the community and I think do um, a very similar thing to what you were talking about in terms of getting out there, painting the walls, talking to the people who are, who are living and using our services. On the inclusion side of it, we have a major uh, project called Internet Essentials that uh, is, is aimed at getting kids, it started out with kids um, who didn't have access to the internet um, online um, at a low cost with, with digital literacy training and with, with um, reduced computers. So that's probably the major thing that we do. Um, the accelerator program I see as something that does both at the same time. So uh, Danielle runs it. She, um, she and her team went out and interviewed about 1,500 people. Many of them I found out from Boulder. So uh, I think you guys really have a very good, strong startup entrepreneurial community here. So that goes to Don Epps' point, I think, this morning about how you need to go out and listen to people. And so from that, um, from that interview system that they did for over many, many months, what they learned was that people who were trying to do tech startups, um, what, what they wanted from, from her, from us, from the Accelerator program were to have access to our experts, to find out directly from the people who are you know, in this big corporation uh, the lessons that we've learned and what we know, again, from that leading technology. The second thing they wanted was to be able to test out their products and their services, you know, run the drills, you know, stress test it, find out what worked, help, help improve it. And the third thing that was important was to figure out how to tell their story better because there's a lot of competition, right, for, uh, for that capital and they need to be able to quickly get that together. So that was how Lift Lab started out, which is our accelerator program. An, an interesting point um, uh, is that goes to what Franchella was talking about a little bit today was, uh, this morning, was that less <coughs> than 3% of VC funding goes to founders that are women or persons of color. Less than 3% less than goes to women a lower amount goes to persons of color in terms of VC funding. Our accelerator program is at 50% of the founders are women or founders of color, which is um, what, what I think Danielle would say is we go after the best applicants as a competitive process to get into the accelerator program, but that it's very intentional to make sure that you're getting that pool of applicants so that the best includes those. So I think that that's a, that's a moment, a ray of, of hope or optimism, I think. Uh, that's terrific. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to 
uh, tee up Ellen to talk a little bit about another vision of tech for good. I know you've been involved in different uh, capacities with ICT and broadband. Um, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, first, I just have to thank Amy for inviting me because my father, who is a graduate of CU Law uh, 1980, thinks this is the pinnacle of my career. So. <laughs> Does not matter what I say or what I do next or what I have to, like, this is it. I don't know that he's watching the live stream because he can't manage that. But um, <laughs> so thank you to Amy and thank you to, to the panelists. Um, and, and so when we were talking about this issue of, of tech for good and ICT for good, um, I offered that one of the, the sets of entrepreneurs and uh, issues that I love working on are those disrupting the status quo and thereby somehow upending some of the inequalities that we are concerned about as humans. So um, I'll give a very ethereal um, example and then a, a very, um, I think, a, a more accessible example. So the ethereal one is, um, who in this room is interested in broadband competition? Yeah, yeah, everybody in this room is interested in broadband competition because competition means lower prices for consumers, better services. Um, it, makes, it makes the incumbents better. It, it you know, leads to the kind of infrastructure that um, helps people do good with technology. Um, how many people are interested in point to multi-point millimeter wave spectrum technologies? Yes, everybody who's interested in broadband competition is also interested in these things. Um, and so we get to work with, with companies that um, have generally not thought about the FCC or maybe only filed you know, one um, application or testing application one time. We get to work with them to help them expand on this idea that what they're doing could be extremely impactful for people. It could be extremely impactful for um, some systems of inequality that, that frankly, we're concerned about um, at my firm. So that's one, like, very ephemeral example, though I think uh, millimeter wave spectrum should be very interesting to everybody. <laughs> um, the, the more concrete examples are uh, some of the business-to-business software and services that have made being an entrepreneur, have made some of the difficult things like access to capital or startup costs, et cetera, they have decreased those by so much that being an entrepreneur is actually quite a bit easier than it might have been in 2003, right? You have access to things like Rocket Lawyer or WeWork, forgetting everything that comes with <laughs> that. Um, the, 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 the idea of becoming a business has become so um, disintermediated that uh, it is actually easier now than it ever was before. So that, that's one of the, I think, weird ways that I like to think about tech for good. All right, Balan, I'm gonna come to you with a question in a second, but maybe I'll invite Anne, any reactions to what you've heard so far? I think everything I've heard so far is rem remarkable, actually, but I, um, because, <laughs> but I don't know anything about broadband, so I, you know, I couldn't raise my hand for that. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, this is a rough, this is like going after that last panel, that's like super mm -hmm. rough, right? I mean, <laughs> just so say I'm, something I'm, I'm and drop the mic. I'm trying to here. Yeah. But, um, okay. So Balin, um, I wanna go back to what Ryan presented in terms of uh, a three-step approach to building, um, he didn't quite tee this up, but I know a term that he likes is citizen, on, uh, citizen engineers and a company that's gonna be oriented around building products that have a, a certain type of value orientation, uh, starting with tactical volunteering, uh, expanding to skills and empathy building, and ultimately getting to a company that melds an economic and a social mission together. Uh, you specialize in deploying capital and, 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 and uh, investing companies taking a majority ownership stake. Um, one challenge is, does capital want to get behind a vision like the one that Ryan teed up. What's your reaction from a capital markets perspective of that particular vision, the Martin's model of technology for good? Sure. <clears throat> you know, um, when, you, when you allocate capital, uh, that's internal capital allocation and also capital allocation from an investment standpoint. Um, I'll, I'll start with probably the more 
bigger issue, which is capital allocation internally. Most corporations have lot of lots of capital, and they try to decide what to do with it. If you go to business school, there's really three ways to allocate capital. You allocate to projects that you think can give you great returns. You allocate capital to acquisitions to buy businesses that can grow inorganically. Or you allocate capital to return to shareholders, either in the form of dividends or share buybacks. There's a fourth way of capital allocation, which is paying down debt. But I come from a company called Liberty. We don't pay down any debt. <laughs> so and, um, so those, those are how you do it. If you were truly a, a, a purist manager, you would look at capital allocation strictly from the math of it. Now, the math gets better when the product you're allocating capital to has some value to whoever the recipient is, consumers, business, et cetera. And that value gets built into the numbers. And the value usually today with, you know, has to do some good, right? And, um, and, and by, by good doesn't mean social good, but it has to do something good for the recipient. You mentioned broadband. Broadband does a lot of good for people. Anybody who's in the business of broadband is doing a lot of good for society. So that's one you say, no brainer, I wanna, I'd like to allocate capital to that. Now, however, having said that, business managers don't always do everything by math. I'll give you an example of our company, which is uh, we primarily invest in businesses in Latin America. That's the name, Liberty Latin America. And we invest in the Caribbean, we invest in Central America and South America. <coughs> Two years ago, um, 1970, uh, 2017, September, there was a hurricane that hit Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria, September 20th. And we have a business there, it's a cable company, and um, and it's this little cable company that has about, let's say, 400 million in revenue. Relatively small, but big for Puerto Rico. On September 21st, it went from 400 to zero. So as a manager, you sit back and you realize the consequences of this hurricane on the community and all that, but you also have a capital allocation decision to make. Do I now allocate capital to rebuild in this island that's completely devastated? And knowing full well that It'll be years before the payback comes in. Do I allocate capital to this business to keep the lights on? Do I allocate, do I reallocate capital to my more profitable businesses elsewhere in Chile and Costa Rica, etc.? And if you do the math, you would quickly come to the conclusion that, yeah, you'd want to put money in because you don't you you you, you don't want to abandon this business, but you try not to put as much as you can. You try to allocate more to immediate return businesses elsewhere. We took the decision that was um, fundamentally wrong in all matters of math. <laughs> well, one we said, um, you know, after the hurricane, almost every business shut down. There was no power. People were leaving the islands. So there's no homes. We, we're in the business of selling broadband. There's no homes. There's, there's no power to plug in your Wi-Fi modem. People, last thing on people's minds are, well, how's my Wi-Fi speeds, right? Our call centers were zero. Nobody's calling in to buy broadband. Uh, why would anybody? For, for like six months, there's no power. And we also sell pay TV. That's the last thing in any, anybody's minds. But we said, this is the worst time to tell our employees that you're furloughed or you don't have a job. Mm. You work in call centers. You work in accounting, marketing, whatever it is. There's nothing to market. There's, there's, not, there's no calls coming in. But we said, just come into work, pick up a care package, and go back to your communities. For seven months, there was no business activity, but we did not lay off a single employee, did not follow a single employee, unlike most employers in Puerto Rico, whether in a hotel or pharmaceuticals, etc. Now, we didn't make that decision because we thought, one day this is going to pay back. <laughs> we just made the decision because... We said, well, what if we were living in Puerto Rico? We live in Denver. All the decision makers were in Denver. And this business is in Puerto Rico. Now, fast forward two years later. We have the fastest growing business in Puerto Rico. And I don't say that because of the decisions we made. But it turned out to be the right bet because Puerto Rico is just an amazing place today. Now, if we knew that 
the decision we made had no absolute returns, uh, and things didn't work out the way, and today it's still a laggard and nothing good happened in Puerto Rico, would we have regretted that decision? No, we wouldn't. We would not have. And from a math standpoint, the reason I say it was bad, a bad math decision was one, you have zero revenues, you have a huge amount of costs, and then you got to rebuild, which adds more cost to the business. So a good business manager would say, let's just take off some of those costs, and then you just invest in the infrastructure. When you, the infrastructure is built, then you bring back all the employees in to go sell and, and do stuff. We didn't do that, so the swing for us capital-wise was not just losing 400 million revenue, but spending 700 million more. So it's like a $1 billion swing for the business. Um, will it ever pay back? Uh, I am convinced it will. Will it pay back in two years? Absolutely not. So managers, from a capital allocation standpoint, always start with math, and you have to. That purity is abs absolutely necessary because we are just proxies and we have a fiduciary responsibility to our investors. But then there's a secondary decision after you've done the math and you go, okay, what is the right decision here? And I think this is what differentiates different companies. And companies that adopt CSR usually have managers that have more empathy towards the employees in their communities. And I think in the long run, that's the better way to go. Um, let me op ask an open question to the panel that I think picks up on something that Balin said, which is uh, you made a decision that the math did not necessarily militate in favor for. Um, Ryan, you averted to this at the outset, but um, in at September of 2019, maybe it was August, uh, the business roundtable mm -hmm. uh, articulated a new position with respect to the purpose of a corporation. I see some head nodding around the room, so I know some people are familiar with this, especially students that have been in the room when we've talked about it, <laughs> uh, which is the, the, the Business Roundtable said, uh, no longer do we believe that the primary purpose of the corporation is to maximize returns to shareholders. Instead, the primary purpose should be to serve a wider um, array of stakeholders, which includes Employees, Balan, you're talking about people keeping jobs in the wake of the hurricane, uh, the surrounding community, customers, and potentially environmental concerns among other stakeholders. Um, let me just ask a broad question, which is, um, is this a moment in which there are business decisions that are increasingly being made with a wider variety of stakeholders in mind? I'd love to ha hear specifics about that. And if so, is it being driven by the market or is, are there other drivers such as regulatory pressures that are driving this as well? What levers are driving things in that direction? Well, I would like to jump in here yeah. because I, to that business roundtable uh, press release, I'll believe it when I see it, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical about it. I've talked to a number of startup uh, founders and they're, they're really frightened about taking venture dollars because a lot of them are building technology that includes facial recognition, mm -hmm. it includes a number of technologies that could very easily be misused. And if, if the, the goal is maximum return on investment, they are afraid that they won't be able to make decisions that they feel are ethical. And I, I think you might even look to the example of, um, of WhatsApp. So you had two founders, um, you know, you had Jan and you had Brian. Um, they, they were super happy to have this product to charge people a dollar a year to offer them this communication tool. Uh, and then they got offered, what, $23 billion by Facebook and they couldn't walk away from that, but neither of them are there anymore. And I think it tells you a lot that when Brian started again, he bought the Signal, he bought Signal and made the Signal Foundation, um, which is, and I, and I think that, you know, he and others are struggling with what is the kind of business model that rewards ethical behavior, that rewards ethical decision making, um, where I can actually pay engineers to work for me because they're all being offered like 10X by these big other companies. Companies, what does that model look like? Um, and it's not B Corp. B Corp isn't it. Uh, so what is that? And does that mean that I have to forego venture funding because I can't get these guys to agree, mostly guys, to agree to give me dollars to do the things that I think are right? Um, and that's a very real and lively conversation that's happening among tech founders right now. And I think one of the things that we were talking about as we were coming together was I, I asked um, how 
much things had changed since 2003 when, when you had started up, thinking 2000, we're now in 2020, and I don't think people were having those conversations back then so much. I think that that was a period where there was, you know, the, the um, irrational exuberance of tech was just inherently going to be good for everything. Now we've swung and we're at the, we're at the other extreme to it, but I think that, um, I think that there are, who knows about whether the business roundtable is, is I, I think my, my own personal sense was it was an articulation that needed to be made at a particular moment because of the political forces that were coming from both the right and the left, not just in the US, but around, around the world. There are some companies that signed up to that that I think would say that's what we've all, I, my, my CEO, Brian Roberts, whose dad started the business, and was always very philanthropic in every endeavor he did personally, I think they would say that's what we've always been guided by and that this not necessarily changes anything. But I think that the changes, and I don't know the answer to this, but I think that there are a few trends that I think people are seeing in terms of what happens to those entrepreneurs and what is their, what is their exit strategy. And I think it's, I mean, my own observation is that it's becoming more complicated and it's probably going to continue to become more complicated. I think that there is still a concentration of capital. Um, it's, it's, it's in Boston for the biotech, it's in Silicon Valley. It's, I, I think you've got a nice ecosystem here. Philadelphia, where our company is based, is not a huge um, center of capital, and that's partly because you need to have an ecosystem of companies and small companies that are there. So if it doesn't work out in one job, the employees have a place to go, and so you need to have a, a richness there. But there, Steve Case at AOL, originally has done, I forget what the uh, word is for his campaign, but trying to go across the country and get more venture capital, get more small startups. But I think we have a persistent problem of concentration of capital, which means a concentration of opportunities for, for the small people to come in. I think also, and this is getting, this is my version of Ellen's version of, of the spectrum, but there's a, there's a serious discussion going on now that I think started in Europe, um, is coming over here a little bit about uh, the, what you do about potential competitors. And so Jason Furman, who had been with the Obama White House, um, was hired by the Treasury in the UK to, to do uh, an examination of what should be done about the ecosystem of tech and is it getting too concentrated. One of the things that he, he noted was that of the, I think, several hundred, I think three or four hundred acquisitions that had been made in Europe by big, by the like three or four or five big tech companies, not a single one had been stopped. And, and I think there's now, particularly with Facebook and Instagram, which is the example that I think is used the most often because Instagram had a different model. They were charging, right? And so it wasn't just that you took the technology, you took the business model and said so that you're going to only be using data. And so I think that there is a, a discussion that's going on now about whether there's going to be a little bit of chill of some of the bigger companies doing more vertical integration, which is buying companies that go into the value chain, as well as um, hiring or rather acquiring small companies that wouldn't even tip the, the antitrust um, examination in traditional days, but is that going to be looked at more over time? So I think the trend going forward is going to be... Uh, potentially a more complicated one. So, Brad, you, you asked the question, are companies considering a broader range of stakeholders, right? And are they doing that out of the goodness of their hearts? I'm, I'm summarizing and intentionally in this way. Um, and I look at it from this perspective. I think the, the attack vectors for brand damage have increased considerably since Ryan uh, launched Rally Software. And I think that's a good thing, right? I think that's a good thing if you are interested in the social impact of technology. If you're interested in tech for good, you should be, in, you should be, you should glorify the fact that people can get on Twitter and use a hashtag campaign to shame a company into doing something that you want them to do. Like, I, I think that's a good idea. I would also ask, has anyone in the room talked to a, a reporter in the last month? Okay. Um, and I usually, I get two kinds of phone calls. The first, um, when the techno pessimists are right and something bad happens and a Washington Post reporter calls a, a company or an organization that uh, is doing something, um, then I, I get a call. Um, and 
at that point, it is definitely too late, right? At that point, it is definitely too late for their brand, but I, I guarantee you they have learned something about um, how they conduct business or maybe something they should have looked at beforehand. And, and that would be, uh, Balan, what, what I was thinking about when you were talking about Puerto Rico, and by the way, it's a phenomenal story. I was thinking about how I would have advised you as a consultant and said, the story that is gonna land when you lay off all those employees is really, really bad. So I would argue that that's more of a risk to your business than the cost of keeping them on the payroll. Um, so this may sound like very craven, but you know, capitalism is not a moral play and we're all ardent capitalists and this is the system we live in, so hooray. <laughs> uh, Ryan's about ready to jump out of his seat, Ryan. <laughs> I think I would jump off the cliff on this one. I'm not <laughs> sure I'm an ardent capitalist. It's a human construct. It's a notion that is, that is based on a concept that an econ 101, that everything goes up into the right in constant growth. Our entire tax-based system is built on it. Our entire economy is tied into that notion when we all well and know that we all live on an S-curve. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally living, we have a model constructed over the last hundred years that is fundamentally wrong. We built our entire society around it. All of our tax base is tied into it. We have to grow three to 5% economic growth to have this happen. What has been the end result of this? The widest separation of inequality on the planet and we're on all on all social fronts, we're greatly exceeding our, our economic floor that we should go under for equity. And on four of the major eight environmental ecosystem levels, we're outside our bounds. This system is broken. I'm gonna ask a follow-up so, question that's, uh, that- we've got, a lot, we've got a lot of innovating to do. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna pick up on that in a second. I wanna go back to something that was said just a, a few minutes ago. Um, in terms of, this wasn't quite the language, but future-proofing a company that has a, an orientation of technology for good. And Rally's a very interesting example of this. Where, oh, yeah. uh, so the Rally trajectory was um, best place to work for I don't know how many years in a row in Colorado, um, went public, and then uh, sold to CA in what year? 2015. And um, Ryan, you can disabuse me if I'm missaying this, but they, they threw away like, one of the best cultures in Colorado, one of the best cultures, period. Um, and this is a problem that was raised before in terms of how do you future-proof, even if you get the culture and the orientation right, how do you future-proof it? As you look back, is there anything that you could have done to prevent that? I mean, it had to kill you, didn't it? It was a very hard two years. <clears throat> yep. Uh, we stumbled post-IPO after raising a follow-on round six months later. Um, our stock price went into single digits. We had shareholder, we had activist shareholders. Um, it fundamentally broke up our management team and basically destroyed the, the inner workings of the business. Um, it was a heroic effort to get it out of the toilet and back to above its uh, stock price, and it killed most people along the, the executive team along the journey. Mm -hmm. No, there was no way to avoid that with, uh, without backing up two years and fundamentally fixing the leadership problem. Um. Well, and I, I want to ask you about the public markets and the appetite for serving a wider set of uh, stakeholders than just shareholders. Is, is your sense, uh, you heard Ann express a fair amount of skepticism uh, that Jamie Dimon really believes that uh, serving a wider uh, set of stakeholders is, is sincere. Uh, what's your sense about how the public markets are treating this? <clears throat> um, well, be before I jump into that, yeah. your, your previous question on stakeholders, you know, um, the, the various stakeholders, including community, consumers, whoever your customers are, government, your management team, um, all except for the management team has absolutely no impact on the behavior of a corporation. Uh, governments can regulate bad things, but it's very hard for governments to regulate good things. They can't regulate you to do good. They can regulate you to prevent doing bad things. It's very hard for them. Consumers, yeah, you'd say consumers would say, well, if you're a good company, I buy from you. It's not true. They buy from the cheapest 
value they can get. That's just, just how it is. You, you know, the, the advice you would have given me that says if you laid off people, it would be bad PR. Guess what? In Puerto Rico, everybody that laid off people, now that they're back, nobody gives a hoot. They are just <laughs> doing just fine, competing with this. Hotels that the Ritz Carlton laid off every one of their staff member, now that they've opened like four months ago, it's like the hottest hotel in town. It, you know, people really forget quickly. Communities, communities likewise. Um, Target contributes more to a community out of their profits than Amazon does for Boulder. Yet, people don't blink an eye. They go look at Target and then go buy from Amazon. That's just how nature is. Management is the only one that can actually drive the behavior of corporations. And it lays upon events like this, graduate schools, business schools, to train managers to think differently. Now, from the public market standpoint, public markets don't reward Just a clarifying question. Are you including boards as part of management on this? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Boards Sorry. as well. Okay. You know, I just happen to work for one of the best capital allocators probably in the history of the United States. One would say even better than Warren. And his name is John Malone. I was trained by John Malone as the capital allocator. I worked for John Malone as the capital allocator. When we made that decision on Puerto Rico, John is on my board and the largest single shareholder of my company. Without blinking an eye, he said that was the right decision. Now, this is the best capital allocator, the best returns of, if you've ever invested with him, right? So even the best capital allocators make decisions not purely on math. Now, however, on the public market st standpoint, absolutely, it's all about the math. Mm -hmm. There is nobody, I mean, it's nice to say all the right things, the business roundtable I agree with, and it's nice to put out all those things. BlackRock will come out and say, you gotta do this for your, you know, if I was to invest in you, you gotta like allocate all this, but guess what, as soon as you miss your numbers, BlackRock is gonna like start selling your shares, <laughs> right? That is just, and, and that efficiency of the marketplace um, is important because it makes decision making very clear. Now, management will have to balance between meeting those needs and meeting the needs of the other, you know, their, their, their own internal um, convictions, as well as the employees. Management want the employees to feel good about business. When I talk to my employees, I say, we are building broadband and connectivity to the unconnected. That is our mission in Latin America. We are building connectivity in Costa Rica, in Panama, in Ecuador, in Chile, and people feel good about it. And that's our mission. We don't sell, and I don't mean to uh, disrespect other industries, but we don't sell tobacco. We don't sell things that, you know, we, we don't sell military equipment. We don't sell bombs. We don't sell bullets. We don't sell stuff like that. And we, we say that internally. You work here because you're doing good for the plate communities that we serve. And, there is, and some employees, that's why they gravitate to companies like us. And others, <clears throat> they may go work for a tobacco company. That, no harm, no foul. That is, you know, no, there's no judgment there. But employees, I think the millennials now are looking for corporations and businesses where they can put in their expertise and their time, and it does make a difference to communities. It's not 100%, but that's certainly the case. Did we go optimism, pessimism, and back to optimism? Is that where we're kind of? <laughs> yeah, that's where um, we landed. All right, I just wanna, I'm just keeping track. I'm keeping. World. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just check. I, I, I would just completely agree with that. I, in terms of before, I at one point in my life, I was with Blair Levin and on a Wall Street firm where we would be taking questions um, from Calpers, from Fidelity, from the big institutional investors. Never, never once, never once heard anything that had to do with any of corporate governance ethics um, contributing to the community. It was all about what's the revenue, what's the income, what's the government doing that could affect that. So it's a very, it's a very um, steely uh, It's very system. efficient. The, yep. the capital markets are very efficient. Well, there, there was, uh, we could leave aside the definition of efficiency for a second, but uh, there, there was one other very, um, I think, interesting uh, claim that you just made, which is that um, at the end of the day, Others are at the margins. It's up to the management team to make any decisions with respect to benefiting other stakeholders. And here, the management team being the executives and the board. Um, I, I guess you know some things that come to my mind in terms of from a policy perspective is 
tax breaks are generally used to incentivize good behavior uh, and or, you know, uh, employees and unions can drive for their, their own interest as well. I'm wondering, in terms of the panel, uh, do you guys think that, you know, those are just uh, rounding errors at the margins or are there uh, others that have a different perspective about this? Right now, they seem to be rounding errors. We've hmm. pretty much annihilated the, the unions on the, and I don't, the, the small little things that we got along the way to stay in Boulder or things like that were definitely rounding errors on the margin hmm. that didn't affect our, was nice, but it didn't affect our reason to stay in Boulder, for example. Alan? Uh, yeah, I don't know if they're rounding errors. I do, I, I am dismayed by um, a declining union movement in this country. I think, again, as ardent capitalists, we should, no, I'm just kidding. I am not, I just know. in case anybody was wondering, it's a, a little bit of irony that may have been missed. Um, I think, but I am chilled by the notion that we are reliant entirely on five to 10 individuals, either on a management team or a board of directors who may or may not look like me or um, the, the communities that, you know, what Francella was talking about earlier, like that, that, ooh, I don't think any amount of humanities education or philosophy training is going to actually get us somewhere. So to your point, um, I think tax incentives, I also think there, um, there are some fundamental things we can do in terms of social policy and education policy and the things around, you know, that give people opportunity to get to this point, but I've now switched now, and I'm back to pessimism. I'll, I just, I don't I'll even know. I'll give you two other examples on that. One, I think the Google and, and Amazon employees right now who are, are, are making a big voice yeah. of, of themselves about the stance associated with the climate policy of those organizations is an example of the employees having a big voice, yeah. even though they're not unionized. Uh, in that just regards. give them a few minutes. I mean, yeah. there were, <laughs> there's a big, there's a lot of companies that have employees that are jonesing for unionization in Silicon Valley. Oh, and for it's sure, freaking everybody out, right? Yep. Um, but I mean, are we talking about incenting a company to do? I mean, because there's like the CSR piece of mm -hmm. every company doing CSR, and then there's the whole notion of companies that are from the ground up developing technology for good, right? For to be used. Um, really in a, in, in a very sort of narrow way as opposed to an organization that sort of as a side hustle does some CSR stuff because they want their employees to feel good about their mission and, and purpose, right? I mean, those are two very different types of organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think we're talking more about the latter than the former necessarily, or are we talking about the former here? It's hard to find a company yeah. with, that's the narrow cast of... I mean, you could describe open source technology as an example of an organization that has created technology primarily for good in mm -hmm. a way that it is available for the entire community to use around the world and fork and continue to uh, and extend right. as they need to. Can I inject a little optimism into the conversation then? Please. So when I was at the World Economic Forum um, at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is a very humbly named organization, <laughs> sure. um, we were working with an organization based in California called Zipline. Zipline makes drones. And when we think of drones, we, th we either think of Amazon dropping a package on our driveway, or we think about surveillance. Um, but Zipline delivers blood products uh, to remote regions in Rwanda. So Rwanda is a very mountainous country, 63% percent of the people in Rwanda exist on a dollar 25 a day or less 83 percent live in remote regions around the, the the country the infrastructure is not great um, and blood products are remarkably perishable so um, so zipline uses their drones to deliver blood products to maternal care centers in remote regions of Rwanda and now Ghana 40% of the blood products in Rwanda now are delivered by Zipline drones. Mm -hmm. So that's an uplifting story of a company that does a remarkable thing with their technology. Um, there are other examples that I could cite um, about organizations uh, that are using distributed ledger technology in places like Colombia. So interestingly, um, distributed ledger, it's not all about blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Turns out it's a really great supply chain management tool. And if you're trying to fight corruption, it actually turns out that having an immutable distributed ledger technology at your 
fingertips um, can help a lot. And so there was a partnership we had in Colombia working with a, a small region um, in Colombia, and it was on school lunches. So it turns out that there's a lot of corruption in bidding for these contracts. Mm -hmm. And while the bids were very high and going to these folks, they weren't actually delivering lunches to kids, so kids were going hungry. So they were using um, distributed ledgers a way to fight corruption in Colombia. Um, those are just two examples. Um, I'm on the board of the Cloudera Foundation, and one of the biggest challenges in big data, and this is a very small foundation, it's grant making, um, they're working with an organization in Burkina Faso to help them um, deliver, to actually help uh, caregivers uh, collect data on, on children. They have a, a relatively high uh, uh, mortality rate among young children. Um, and many of these organizations, these NGOs, don't, they can't compete for data scientists because they can't pay for them. Um, they can't, they don't have the resources at the ready to be able to use um, big data tools, so they can't collect and analyze data at scale. Um, so the Cloudera Foundation is helping with that. And it's kind of interesting to me, because I spent most of my career working in data, is that you have kind of this whole framework that we worry about all the data oligopolies out there. And meanwhile, in the NGO world, data is like an inch deep and a mile wide. And so these are like, these are organizations that are, they're using technology in a really good way. And some examples of organizations that for the most part exist to deliver services with technology in a very positive way in the world. Not simply as kind of a little side hustle that they do so that, you know, the millennials and Gen X or Gen Z people feel good about coming to work every day. You know, this is mission critical. I don't see it that way. I know. No, I know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm being Here's a little... Here's the people that bolted on this side concept to make it look good for employees. But there are or for a the lot consumers. of companies that do. I agree, there and are. that's definitely not the place where we're going to have to end up. Yeah. If we're going to change this notion and gain some empathy and build a nuanced ability to serve multiple shareholder, stakeholders in the system, you can't stop there with mm -hmm. paying off people through nice charitable gifts True. on the side as a foundation. Mm -hmm. That is not going to drive the empathy necessary to get here. So it's not black and white. We have to get everybody to this place. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, uh, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A um, with everybody else. Um, and that relates to, um, I'm going to go back to the first panel, and Alan from Mozilla talked about uh, the values by which they make determination as to how they build their product. And um, that gives rise to me to a fascinating set of questions around who participates within the organization in determining the good, that is those values, and what sort of design works for different institutions that are engaged in this endeavor. And I, it may not, it, it won't look the same across different organizations, but I'm guessing, I, I'm guessing that you have very concrete experiences from, from different areas. Uh, can you give us some concrete examples of here is who participated and what it looks like when we debate what is the good associated with our company or our institution? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. It may sound trivial, but, uh, uh, and, and by the way, it's very optimistic. I, I, I feel really optimistic, by the way, that uh, the future of uh, corporates, corporations in America, certainly in America, uh, much more forward-thinking than, than we used to be. Um, even though our primary stakeholder remains the shareholder, the person that gave us their hard-earned cash to put to work, they would always remain a primary stakeholder. You can see, for even with the business roundtable, the fact that a group of CEOs got together and said, these other things are important, it's an amazing start. Uh, and the decision-making, I think, uh, are getting better and better for the, for the good of community. Now, having said that, pure question. You know, a, a few years ago, I, I worked in a different company in Europe, and we were building, it's a cable company, and one of the biggest products you build is co something called a set-top box, which everybody, you know, like, it's a set-top box. How, how hard can that be? But, you know, it is quite complex, you know, with all the different chips and, and everything that goes into a building a set-top box. Anyways, we have this one product engineer that comes in, and he looks at this box, and he goes, oh, great UI, great everything but it consumes too much power. Mm -hmm. And guess what? This box is like a refrigerator. It is on 24-7. If we can just take off like four watts, and he did this like nice little slide, and he goes, imagine how much power we can save, and he does the math backwards around coal production, etc. and everybody's like, wow, okay, cool. How hard can this be? 
turned out to be really hard to take like four or five watts out of a set-top mm -hmm. box. You got to put in more software, more technology to like turn down the hard drive, put it to sleep, and put it to sleep. When somebody turns it on, it comes on immediately because nobody likes to wait, right? The channel guide and PS, you know, it's pretty complex as it turns out to be, but nevertheless, people worked on it. The, the moral of the story is if you hire really good people and you hire people that think a lot more than what their current job is and you train them to think that way, beautiful things happen. I, I've got a few more other examples, but that, that, you know, that, that's an example of how corporations are changing. I think in the old days, somebody would say, four watts, how much is that going to cost us? If, to build software, to get more software developers to come in, to go figure it out, to get our a hard drive supplier to figure out how to turn off, turn on, like in 0 0.2 milliseconds, that's going to be a much more expensive drive, etc. That question didn't even come up. And I suspect in Comcast or any other company today, if somebody had asked that question, the people would say, okay, let's go figure out how to solve it as opposed to how much is this going to cost us. And I think it goes to, I was talking to a former um, FCC colleague here in one of the coffee breaks and we were talking about um, the state of the world, but, but one, of the, one of the issues that strikes me is, I think partly it depends on the size. So I, I think a large government, a large university, a large company have more in common in some ways in terms of how you're going to get ideas to, to bubble up. And I think that, I think that you, I think so much of it depends upon if you've created um, a culture that does um, allow people to, to voice and to, to make proposals because I think that, I think in, in, in government now, for sure, but it's probably always been thus, there, are, there are, is inertia that comes in and you don't see people bringing new ideas in. And companies, particularly large companies, you definitely see that. Um, I think, you know, the, the academic institutions, there's a lot of discussion about just the cost of education for, for families now, and, and a piece of that has to be figuring out novel ways to do education. So I think so much of it depends upon creating, it's not even so much who within the structure says it, but have you created a culture that allows people to challenge, I guess? Well, I'll, I'll shed a little light, because. I mean, I, was, I started at Slack as the head of policy, and then shortly after I joined, I became the head of people and culture, which is kind of a weird transition, <laughs> but happy to... So, so we had a whole conversation around uh, value, and, and, and value and beliefs and what we as an organization wanted to do. Um, and, and it was very top-down. Um, we'd had a, you know, there were a couple of things that we, we really worked hard on. One was diversity and inclusion, but one of the, the things that Stuart Butterfield was particularly passionate about was criminal justice reform. So we're like, okay, well, how can we make that real and how can we make it authentic? And I don't mean to uh, cast aspersions on all CSR programs or what have you. I just know too many of them that are largely marketing material and not real. And I think what, what resonates with employees the most is the authenticity around it and how do you make it authentic. And that was a real challenge around criminal justice reform um, because it, how do you, you know, a lot of people talk about it, but the real challenge is are you hiring people into your organization from the system? Um, Slack partnered right before I left the organization. We set up a partnership with an organization called The Last Mile at San Quentin Prison. And I'm like, hey, Stuart, you like criminal, you, you're interested in this issue of criminal justice reform? We're going to San Quentin today. That was, you know, he went there and he was really uh, moved by that. And so Slack not only partnered to help train inmates there, and, which is a big challenge when you cannot actually use the internet in, in prison, right? So you have to simulate that environment. Um, but then how do you take take people uh, and reintegrate them into society and give them jobs. Um, and Slack has, if you look it up, there are some great examples of how they're really making that program real. Um, and I was there behind the scenes when we had those conversations. They were difficult conversations, um, but it's one way to, again, to take it from just like an idea that feels good into something that the organization is really standing behind. Um, and I think it'd be great if more organizations did that. Uh, Sister Helen Prejean, who uh, was, um, popularized uh, in the, the movie Dead Man Walking. She's the nun from Dead Man Walking uh, nice. uh, and wrote the book that gave rise to it. Uh, she was here uh, mm. about three months ago mm. and she said, the heart cannot feel what the eye cannot see. Mm. And uh, it keeps coming up again and again today. Okay, uh, first question. The wiser rule is in the fact. Uh, student, Students first. Jump into the fray. Oh, the, 
Looks like Phil's going to jump into the fray as well. <laughs> <laughs> we have a student question. Wilson. Uh, thanks so much, you guys. I had a question. Someone on the panel mentioned the motivation for small startups to sell to tech giants like Google or Facebook, um, and often at times far exceeds their their current market value. Um, what are some ways that we could sort of discourage platforms from swallowing up these smaller companies to expand horizontally or vertically, but without sort of harming the motivation to to innovate or um, or invest? I think Eric Reese is doing a <clears throat> fantastic job at this right now with the long-term stock exchange. Uh, the notions, it's a company that's been approved by the SEC to start offering stock, uh, but you're forced to hold it as opposed to huh. turn it over in minutes or seconds, uh, depending on how you play this game. Um, and as a way, as an alternative to create a, a place for organizations that have a longer-term mission, that want to play a longer-term game, uh, without feeling the pressure to have to succumb to what's what's the, of the moment, Let's say it that way. That's one. By the way, one of the challenges today with these large platforms, uh, most innovative companies build their companies with the hope that one of these big guys would buy them, and um, which in itself kills innovation. Um, <clears throat> now, I've talked to Phil about this as well. I mean. Uh, Regulators have been asleep in the wheel for the last few years on platforms uh, consolidating almost uh, any innovative company, including WhatsApp. They, they should never have let Facebook buy WhatsApp. I mean, they're going to try to stop AT&T buying Warner Media. I mean, two, like, no offense, but old companies. And here you've got, like, two bigger companies, bigger market caps doing a transaction and not even... Uh, let me put a fine point on Wilson's question, which I think is a great question, which is, can you have both of these things, right? Can you, in some respect, chill the merger and acquisition activity of large incumbents swallowing up startups, and at the same time, not frustrate the incentive to do a startup, not frustrate the market value of private uh, companies along the way? Can you have these two things, or we just need to say, nope, there's going to be a trade-off, and we're willing to, uh, in, the, in the interest of antitrust, allow for a dampening of enthusiasm in the startup market? I mean, I think that that is the debate that's going on, right? So that was part of what was behind Lena Khan's law school review article, so inspiration for all the students in their law review articles, is, um, and that's definitely the core of the competition policy debate that's going on at the European Union level mm -hmm. and in the member states right now. And, um, you know, the, 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 the hipster, uh, so-called antitrust would say that they're, um, that, you know, you need to account for, and Phil should, if he's still here, should uh, opine because he's much more experienced than I am, but that they, you need to account for things other than the effect on price. The more traditional antitrust folks would say, we do that. That's part of our framework. We, we look at quality. We look at innovation. To your point and to Bond's point, that's about what effect do these acquisitions have on innovation, I think, is the, is the core point right now that everybody is wrestling with and nobody knows the answer to because you don't want to chill the exit strategies for the small startups that are coming up. They, they do need to go somewhere, at least many of them do, and yet if you do, the concern is if you allow them all to be gobbled up by a small set of companies, you're not keeping a rich enough ecosystem in there. And, and not, just, not just technical, but again, business model. Innovation, I think, is something that people, you know, are are paying attention to and keeping in mind. So I don't, I don't think people are willing yet to say it's sort of it's the yin yang thing that we've been talking about all day, right? It's like they're the absolutists on either side. I think are um, not not pushing the conversation forward. It's the people who are trying to do the hard work in the middle. I asked somebody who'd come from the Justice Department, who's now in private practice, what what are places, what are things that antitrust law can do to, to get at that innovation, right? Because it's so hard. It's much easier to do modeling of price effects. And one of the things that he said that they had done was they had looked at, um, they'd done uh, reviews of, of, I think it was, I can't remember if it was law review articles or if it was patent filings, but they looked at constellations. They used sort of somewhat sophisticated modeling to look at how often 
patents fi filed by a particular company were getting, were getting cited to and relied upon and built off, and that was a way to, to start to tap at that was a measure of innovation and did we, did we want to let it get squashed or not. So I think it takes new methods, right, and, and more sophisticated thinking about how to, how to get to the sweet spot that doesn't kill either side. Other questions for the panel? Let's go to the back. Oh, actually, let's go back here first and we'll work, work our way across. Yeah, Richard Bennett, High Tech Forum. Um, hi, folks. Um, I, I'm curious about this question of why the antitrust regulators permitted some, so many mergers, you know, involving Amazon and Google and Facebook back in the day when they were so obviously troublesome to, I think, everyone in the public interest community and lots of people in the business community. Is it because they were too obsessed with other demons like net neutrality um, with the idea that the real enemies of innovation and progress were the large companies circa 2010 versus the large companies circa 2018? I'm not a lawyer, but uh, it would seem like uh, a lot of the platform companies um, to, to argue the harm to consumers a lot harder because they never had a product that somebody actually paid for. You don't actually pay for a Google search. You don't actually pay for you know, uh, a Facebook call or you know, having on their, being on their network. And therefore, it's harder to say the combination would have a harm on consumer, prices would go up, or et cetera, which is the traditional way of looking at antitrust. Um, the world has changed. Now, it's really concentration of power. It's concentration of information sharing. It's concentration of distribution of content um, that's different than circa 20, 30 years ago. If you look at Time Warner and AT&T combining, I mean, it's a bunch of linear channels that hardly anybody in this room watch, right? It's a bunch of uh, who makes a voice call anymore on a landline, right, which is your prime... It, yet there was a lot more scrutiny because there was a price effect on consumers, apparently. Um, and that's how they look at it. So they have to change the framework of how they look at it. I'm sure there's a lot of lawyers and government officials now worried about that. But, I, I but 20 know. years ago, they weren't worried about it. I, I don't know. I, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm not a lawyer, nor do I study this topic. But I, I wonder a lot about the pressure associated with Chinese-based companies in comparison uh, in that context. And that... They, the concern was, are we keeping up? I'll say something controversial and, and defend the platform companies and say, not really defend them, but um, <clears throat> I think inherent in your question, Richard, is how uh, effective at lobbying or ineffective at lobbying some of the, some of the larger platform companies have been in Washington, D.C., and understanding, right, that we can have a discussion about the legal concepts and we can have a discussion about the harms for consumers, et cetera, but at the end of the day, you have members of Congress and the committees of jurisdiction and the FTC, and those are just people. And uh, there's, there's immense um, power dynamics that we are kind of undiscussed um, in this really utopian conversation, so. Yeah. I mean, I there. think you could, our argument used to always be competition's a click away. Consumers can go choose whatever they want. There's very little barrier to switching your search engine, except that we know that scale really matters in this marketplace, right? And that the more you do, the better you get, the faster, you know, it's Amazon's distribution is remarkable. And I buy stuff because I get it 10 seconds from when I order it. You know, I mean, Zappos is shipping me stuff without my even asking them to now, right? I mean, they're, it's, it's, and it's convenient and we're, you know, and so consumers are happy with that. So it seems beneficial, but you know, you play that out a little bit and, um, and it gets a little bit worrisome. Um, I think, you know, I, 
the folks over at Snapchat are probably not so off, not feeling so awesome about the fact that Facebook rolls out a lot of copycat features at scale. That they in, so innovation is happening. They're innovating, and then it's getting their, their, you know the fast followers coming along and distributing it. Um, I worked at Slack, and Microsoft is bundling Teams for free. Mm -hmm. You know, and it may not be as good as, but if it's okay and it's free, it's maybe free. people will use it, right? So there, are, you know, it, it's a little bit. I feel always like we're having sort of the the Betamax VHS conversation, like VHS sucked, but you know, I mean, it was there, it was available, it was open, you know. So I don't know, I don't know the answer to your question because I too am not a lawyer here. So there's another question back there. Let's go back center. Hi, thank you guys. Um, I'm uh, I'm very heartened by the conversation about trying to get companies to do good, um, whether through VC or whatever the, the model is. Um, my question is more about accountability. Uh, how do you send signals to consumers and um, to regulators that your program is actually doing good um, and not a PR whitewash? Um, is there a way to demonstrate accountability uh, beyond just relying on statements like uh, that, that this has been baked into the process? Ryan, maybe I'll ask you to start by saying a word about the B Corp. Sure. Uh, I think B Corp's one of those ways to do that. Uh, if you haven't seen it or understand it, it starts through a certification process. That certification process has continually been stepping its way up as as to what is required to be able to meet the 80% standard on a year-over-year -year basis. So <clears throat> there is an external entity, and in this case, uh, auditing the, the self-audit from the organization. Um, so I think in that regard, it it does find its way in that setting. You see 1% uh, for the planet f showing up that way. You even see Pledge 1% showing up that way a little bit, but B Corp certainly has more of the consumer brands to it than, uh, and you see it in food, obviously, a lot. Um, I think you'll see Patagonia's Renewable and Organic Choice rock standard show up here shortly as we, as we try to figure out what does that mean uh, because we didn't do a very good job in defining organic. Um, so there's a, now a new set in that area. But I think you're going to see most of this stuff come from the industries itself, not from the government. And there's a lot, there's a lot wrapped up in that notion of accountable, mm -hmm. too. So I think to, to, it's an interesting discussion and a long one, but I think you need to parse out accountable for what and accountable to whom. Because um, I don't think there's a simple, single answer for how you talk about accountability. Yeah, and sometimes <clears throat> you, you have to worry about the fact that when you make people publish all this stuff, it's really published by their marketing departments. And it's really published, uh, not necessarily, I mean, with just many motivations. I mean, you go to a hotel and they say, if you don't want to, you know, have your towels wash, you know, hang it here, put a sign up there. And you feel good, okay, I don't, you know, I'm saving something. But really, is the hotel manufacturer, the hotel uh, operator, doing this because they really care about the environment, or now they can lay off five more housekeepers because they don't need, I mean, that many housekeepers? And if you really look through it, you'll see that they've reduced staff, and it's just a cost-saving measure and nothing to do with, you know, saving water or saving your washing machine or whatever it is, right? And <clears throat> our company, we actually don't publish anything on CSR. We do a lot of things, but we don't publish it because when I look at it, it's like our marketing department just put that together and we're like, it's not, not necessary. If you do good, you do good. You, you don't need to brag about it. Let's go up here. We've got about two or three more minutes. Yep. Hello, I'm Paul Goodman. I'm with the Green Lighting Institute. We're out in California. Uh, and I advocate on behalf of communities of color. Uh, many of those communities are low income. And when you talk to those communities, I don't want to discount any of the benefits folks have discussed here, but what they need is investment. They need jobs. They need dollars. And while it's nice to hear, for example, that uh, Comcast Incubator is being so intentional about uh, people of color and about women, uh, by Comcast's own data, uh, in terms of contract spending in California, 3.9% uh, of Comcast's spending is with businesses owned by people of color, and 3.6% of Comcast spending is with women-owned businesses. So my question is, how do you use the models you've discussed 
to drive investment in unserved and underserved communities. So just to come back on, on that very specific point, I don't know state specific. I, I um, know that at least at the employee level, over half of our VPs and above are women and people of color. So in terms of employment, it's a, it's a record that, um, that we're very proud of. Uh, one of the individuals who, well, by the way, one of my policies is not to talk a whole lot about people who can't make it, but in this case, uh, <laughs> your question uh, relates to someone who was on this panel, Delaney Keating, who's the executive director for Startup Colorado. Startup Colorado is a joint program between Silicon Flatirons and the state of Colorado that focuses on at least a dimension of what you're talking about, and that is uh, supporting entrepreneurs primarily in rural areas. Uh, and what you're talking about is spot on in terms of one of the challenges of, of growing a business and capital. Uh, and, and I don't necessarily have a solution to this, except to say that some of the answers, which um, you know, can help in a piecemeal way, just are not comprehensive. So for example, uh, the state of Colorado has about six cities with coal plants that are going to be shut down for environmental reasons. We talk about trade-offs of goods, right? They're environmentally problematic. Uh, you know, for those communities, they're going to lose two, four hundred jobs. It's going to be a massive problem for those communities economically. And guess what? A couple angel investors or one, two VC investments ain't going to replace all those jobs. Right. And so what you're talking about in terms of larger scale solutions, one of the most interesting I've heard floated is a development bank for the state of Colorado. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. It's a massive problem. But you know, your, your uh, problem, I, I just think we need to think bigger in terms of some of the scale of the, of the solutions. Uh, with that, um, please help me give a warm thank you to this panel. It's great. Thank you. Uh, so for our final presentation of the night, we are delighted to welcome Ann Toth, who you've just heard from when she stepped in and helped us out graciously on this last panel. Uh, so she's Chief Executive Officer of Privacy Works, and as you heard a little bit about, has had an impressive career working on privacy, trust, diversity, and inclusion with companies like Slack, Google, and Yahoo, and most recently worked with the World Economic Forum Center on the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And in this capacity, she's testified before Congress and the European Commission on issues like behavioral advertising and search data retention. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Anto. Am I, am I live? Am I live? Can you hear me? All right, so you're getting like a super double dose of me today. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, I just thought I'd hang out here and sit. It feels like we've gotten a little bit relaxed as the day's gone on, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I'm Ann Toth, and I'm really thrilled to be here. And I'd like to thank the team uh, at Silicon Flatirons, and in particular Amy, for inviting me to join you all today. Um, especially on this day when we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Silicon Flatirons, so that's really exciting. Um, I myself have worked most of my career in Silicon Valley, but then I moved to Silicon Slopes a few years ago, and so I'd like to just say the altitude here is great. Um, it's really a good thing. Uh, I do realize that I have the unenviable task of being between you and cocktails, um, so I'm going to try to keep it lively. Um, and it's been a long day, and it's been a snowy day, and I appreciate you all sticking with me. Couple disclaimers. Um, I'm a little stream of consciousness. I like to storytell, so I'm going to try to keep it real. Uh, the other is that I like audience engagement to keep you guys on your feet, so I might do a little of that. Um, I'll also say that I always, you know, I feel a little naked up here without my PowerPoint, because they said, do you want to have PowerPoint? And I said, no. I'm going to go without it. Um, funny little story is that over the holidays, uh, I had some friends over, and my friend's daughter, uh, her, all of her family, everyone in her family are doctors. And she came up to me during the holidays, and we're making like Christmas cookies, and she says, Anne, I'm doing pre-med, and it's like super hard, and I don't know, I'm not sure I'm going to be a doctor. She's like, what, what do you do if you're not a doctor? Because like her mom's a doctor, her dad's a doctor, aunt, uncle, grandparents, everybody. And I looked at her, and I stopped, and I thought, 
pretty much meetings in PowerPoint. So my goal this year is to eradicate PowerPoint, and if any of you can help me eradicate meetings, <laughs> all right, my life would be like super awesome. Okay, so this year's conference theme, technology optimism and pessimism, is incredibly timely and very on point. Um, I think there are many, many executives in Silicon Valley who have had their Oppenheimer's regret moment about, oh my God, what did I build and how did it get weaponized this way? Um, they never dreamed that things would happen the way that they have, but that doesn't necessarily make them pessimists. So I went to Merriam-Webster uh, for the actual definition of optimism and pessimism, and if you guys don't follow Merriam-Webster on Twitter, I highly recommend it because they throw shade equally at everyone and it's actually really very amusing. Um, so optimism is hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. Pessimism is a tendency to see the worst aspect of things or believe that the worst will happen, a lack of hope or confidence in the future. So in terms of whether I'm on team optimism or team pessimism, my short answer is yes to both, but mostly team optimist. Um, I am an unabashed optimist about technology and its present and future potential. Um, and in this particular moment, like some of our previous speakers, I'm sadly pessimistic about people. Um, but hopeful about future generations. So the, the funny thing about my career, actually, is that I, I'm personally very much a sort of get-it-done pragmatist kind of person, um, but I always seem to wind up working for philosophers, which I think is probably actually a good combination of things. Um, I mentioned earlier that I worked at Slack and I worked for Stuart Butterfield. So Stuart Butterfield, uh, prior to entering into uh, tech and software development, was a PhD candidate of philosophy at Cambridge. So I never ever could, could win an argument with that man, ever. Um, but uh, he, so he was a philosopher and the CEO of any company has an outsized role in developing the culture of that organization. So when I was leading people in culture there, we, we ran an offsite with the executive team to try to distill down our culture in, in words, in values, in beliefs. And during a whiteboarding exercise, we're sort of standing there, we're trying to come up with words, and Stuart kind of looks wistfully and he says, eudaimonia. And I, if anybody here who speaks Greek, check me on the pronunciation, but we all kind of like stopped and looked at him like, what is he talking about? And it's Greek for human flourishing. So we put the word flourishing on the whiteboard and our CTO was like, no, 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 because like bacteria and yeast flourish, so we don't need that. Let's come up with a better term. And so we sort of landed on the term thriving, which became one of the core six values that we, we had at Slack. And the reason I use that term and, and tell that story is that when technology works best, it helps us as humans live our best lives, uh, experience eudaimonia, human flourishing, not just convenience, not just, you know, um, I got a slightly more relevant ad today on, on this website, but to really help us live a much more a positive life, a better life, um, one that is demonstrably better than, than some of the things which we currently trade our data and value for. And so, let me give you some examples of what a future could look like where we're experiencing the benefit of, of human flourishing and thriving through technology. We can call this world Anne's utopian dream world, um, and many of these examples are drawn from some of the work that I did at the non-pretentious Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, we focused on nine disruptive technologies there, and they included things like IoT and connected devices, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, precision medicine, autonomous vehicles and drones, blockchain, etc. Um, most of the data I'm going to cite is easily Googleable and readily available to you. Um, but I'm going to start with an example uh, of human flourishing through connected cities and cars. This is sort of part of the reason I'm so optimistic. Now, I lived in Mountain View, California and in Los Altos, uh, which means that I have frequently driven on roads with fully autonomous vehicles on those roads. Most people have not had that experience. I can tell you it's incredibly frustrating because they follow every and all traffic laws. Um, so that can, be, that can be a little infuriating. But, but I want you to kind of go on this journey with me and imagine what life would be like in this future where cars are fully autonomous and connected. So now imagine the distance between cars traveling could be millimeters, inches. Today it's like three or four car lengths unless you're feeling really aggro and tailing somebody. But mostly, you know, imagine a world where now cars are suddenly very close together. They could effectively operate like train cars. 
traffic would be dramatically reduced. So researchers have found, and I don't know if you realize, like most traffic is that oscillation stuff that happens back and forth, and it's, you know, when you get, when you're in traffic and then you get to the, the bottleneck and you realize there was no accident and it's actually just because people are doing this all the time. Um, so in some, uh, some recent field experiments, they controlled only about 5% of cars were autonomous, but, but because of those cars, they actually were able to dramatically reduce the oscillation in traffic, which just 5% of autonomous vehicles in this example um, reduced fuel consumption by 40% and braking uh, events by 99%, which is pretty dramatic. So now imagine a world where all of those cars are fully autonomous. So drivers would no longer be drivers, they would be passengers free to work on tasks, incre uh, increasing their productivity. So the average daily commute uh, for people who drive in their car is 26 minutes each way. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people have a 26 minute or longer commute? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people have an hour long commute? How many people have longer than an hour? All right, how many of you would like those, those minutes back, <laughs> right? Everybody, right? So on average, if you use this math, folks are losing on average, an hour a day. In, in places outside of New York and LA, it's, it's closer to 90 minutes round trip. So let's just take the average. That's 250 hours per year, or 10 and a half days of productive time that you could get back uh, if you were not driving. Um, so that's a pretty substantial thing. There have actually been even studies that have shown that, uh, research has shown that workers would rather take a 20% pay cut than add 20 minutes to their commute. And almost a quarter of people surveyed said that they have actually quit a job because of a terrible commute. So let's move from time saved and productivity to lives saved. So globally, every year, 1.25 million people die in automobile accidents, and anywhere from 20 to 50 million people are injured uh, in an automobile accident. If you look just at the US, it's 40,000 fatal car accidents per year, um, and about two million drivers who experience a permanent injury. Now, if you think about living in a world where all of the cars are talking to each other and we can dramatically reduce dramatically reduce fatalities and injuries. That's, I mean, not only is that dollars saved, that's real tangible lives saved. Now let's think about this from the standpoint of city planning and urban development. Um, so what if we didn't need to own cars? Um, so I know some people who'd be crushed because there's some people who actually really like to drive their car, but for a lot of people, and particularly younger generations, it's kind of a utility, it's sort of a thing we need to do. Um, so if we had an on-demand fleet of electric cars, um, that could be a really game-changing thing. So today, if you are the average commuter and you're driving about an hour a day, your car is sitting idle for 23 hours a day. So the utilization rate for automobiles right now is about 4 to 5%. So imagine that you could reduce the number of vehicles on the road by having an all-on-demand fleet. I mean, some estimates have ranged up to 90% reduction in the number of vehicles on the road. Um, so we'd need far fewer cars, and we wouldn't need garages. So in Los Angeles County today, 14% of the landmass of Los Angeles County is allocated to garages and parking spaces. And if you add residential garages, it's about 20%. And that's about the average for most urban environments. What would you do if you could take 20% of the land in San Francisco, in Denver, in Los Angeles, in New York, and use it for something other than cars? I mean, think about that for a moment, right? We have a housing issue in many of these cities. You could build housing. You could build green spaces. These, these garages, these um, parking lots, and, uh, and in many cases roads now, if we get to that, are impermeable surfaces, right? Think about the, the heat reflected. So the upside to eradicating cars is actually pretty dramatic. And I can't help but think, like, as I say all this, I'm thinking, like, Big Yellow Taxi is playing in my head. I don't know if anybody's a Joni Mitchell fan, but that's what I'm hearing right now. Um, so actually, you know, there was a joke made earlier, but uh, flying taxis are a thing, and they're being developed in many, not just in the US, but they're being tested in, in many parts of the world, including the Middle East. Um, you really, if you're flying over the desert, no one's living there, it's actually, you know, pretty safe, and that's the main issue they're trying to figure out. But imagine that all of these on-demand cars are actually not on the road. Imagine they're in the airspace. Um, that's a thing, and there are companies, in Mountain View, there's Kitty Hawk, um, who've already tested uh, a self-driving or a, an autonomous uh, air taxi. 
So obviously, all these vehicles generate a lot of data, and I know that there's a downside here, so I promise I will get to that, but I'm staying with the optimism theme here. You could engineer cities and city planning a lot better if you had better data on how people move within the cities. We're getting better at that, we are, um, but there is, there is a world here where you could dramatically improve the quality of life and the delivery of services um, from today. So that's one example, and that's largely just around um, you know, autonomous vehicles. Uh, there are several other examples. I've already mentioned Zipline um, and the work that they're doing uh, in Rwanda. Um, but I, I think it goes, I think it, I, I would be remiss without mentioning um, an example that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, healthcare. So how many of you have had a family member that's been impacted by cancer? I mean, I expect to see a pretty uniform show of hands. So this Friday upcoming will be the seventh anniversary of, the, of my mother passing. So she was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer. Um, and it turns out she was Korean and Japanese and in both of those populations, it's very much more common than it is in the Western population. Um, when she came to California uh, to live with us back in 2006, I had asked her doctor, could I get her medical records? And I got uh, a big FedEx package that was about about three inches thick of her medical records. Um, and this was, uh, this was 2006, right? So the, perhaps the, the most tangible benefit uh, to humanity is the ability to, to improve the quality of life through medical treatment or to eradication of disease. Um, and there have been estimates made that up to 80% of medical records even today are siloed uh, and, and not accessible either because of incompatible electronic health record systems or because these, these documents exist on paper. Um, yeah, I went to a conference where Ann Wojcicki was talking about the possibility, she's the CEO of 23andMe, and she said, now imagine that we could access the healthcare records of people who've been treated for cancer over the last 50 years. How long do you think it would take for AI to be able to find some patterns and potentially cures to cancer if we had access to that information? Um, and if not an outright cure, how much better could we improve the delivery of care to the people that we're trying to, to care for? And if you have ever cared for someone who is going through chemotherapy, I think my, my feeling on that was that it was a little bit like imagining what, you know, thinking about bloodletting and how barbaric it is, because we're gonna kill all the fast-growing cells in your body just to address the cancer cells that are growing in your body is a pretty blunt force instrument for, for dealing with an illness. Um, and so those are the things I, I think of having potentially the greatest impact to improving the way that we live through technology. Um, I mean, I can literally go on and on and on, but I know that there is wine waiting for you all, so I'm not gonna go on and on and on. I know that clearly technology is not all sunshine and roses. Even in the self-driving cars example, um, you know, there is a, a great deal, well, First of all, like seventy percent of people surveyed won't get into a self-driving car because they're terrified of it. They, you know, they are absolutely terrified of autonomous vehicles. Um, but uh, there are also estimates uh, around automation and what will happen to the people who drive those cars today. So there has been an estimate, uh, and there are so many estimates out there, and so there's such a wide range. But within the next 20 years, roughly, we expect that three to four million people who drive vehicles for a living will be unemployed. They will not have those jobs any longer. I was at an event with state attorneys general, and I was talking, and I saw the state attorney general from Utah, my state, Sean Reyes was in the audience, and I said, imagine going back to Utah, whose entire population is three million people, and saying, you're not gonna have a job in 20 years, like all of you, done, we're done. Like, what do you, what do, you do with that? Um, and that topic is, is one that I think is really worthy of, of discussion, and I understand there's actually a conference here that's gonna happen soon on that topic about reskilling and, and uh, the effects of automation. So I think that's an Im incredibly important topic to go into, but I'm gonna pivot a little bit to talk about, my, about data privacy and ethics, which are two areas that I know a little bit more about and I'll let you, you good folks at, at Silicon Flatirons address the, uh, the automation problem when you get to that next. Um, so I think actually that two foundational areas that need to be addressed if we're going to have, if we're going to live our best lives, if we're going to thrive as human beings, is that we need to address the data privacy issues and ethics. Um, and so going back to Stuart, he used to say all day, every day, Stuart is, uh, Stuart, software is easy, 
but people are hard, right? People are hard. People are complicated, they're messy, they make sometimes poor choices and do less than admirable things. Um, as I said at the outset, I'm optimistic about tech, but I'm, I'm somewhat pessimistic about people. So how do we put some limits in? How do we build some accountability? Um, and I think that, you know, to, to focus on privacy first, I think at a minimum, and, and I, I'm sure that there will be people who disagree with me, and I absolutely look forward to having uh, a full-throated conversation with you about this. Um, I think that we need to talk about having a workable privacy law. I think we've gotten to a, a near universal consensus that we cannot exist without some kind of harmonization in, in privacy law. Right now, there are about a hundred or more different national privacy laws in the world. Um, and if you go to the subnational level, pr province and state, you're, I mean, California, we now have CCPA, Washington has a law that they're examining. I mean, it's, it's proliferating. I believe at the city level, San Francisco and Oakland and other cities have adopted privacy laws as well. Um, this is rather unsustainable. For those of you who've worked inside an organization trying to deal with compliance matters, it's not sustainable to have that kind of a patchwork quilt. Um, but I, I, I think there's been this sort of notion that the U.S. should just sort of embrace GDPR and just do that. And I think that we might want to pause on that too, because I'm not sure that that's the right solution either. I don't have a draft bill handy, but I have some ideas of what I think are, are difficult problems we need to work through in order to get to a workable privacy law. So first, I would urge that we consider the impact of privacy legislation on startups, SMEs, and not NGOs. Because innovation uh, doesn't often come from the top few tech companies, it comes from the primordial soup of startup land. Um, and what I would say, based on my experience of with working with those companies, is that on a per customer basis, um, the very large companies have a baked in advantage. They have these large legal departments and compliance teams. Smaller companies, and I'm talking companies that have up to 500 employees, they're, you know, that, that size company, they may have one or two lawyers working for them. And the entire month of December, those lawyers were working on CCPA compliance. Um, so the cost for them on a per customer basis even is significantly higher uh, than larger companies. Um, and I would also, you know, there is also the argument that uh, that for many companies, uh, the cost of a European consumer now, given GDPR, is higher. Uh, and so I've seen a number of examples where companies are consciously geofencing and making their products not available to European consumers because they haven't quite figured out GDPR or privacy compliance yet. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think if you extrapolate that out, I think it's entirely possible that there are consumers who will be missing out on some very tangible benefits of technology. Um, so second, uh, privacy rules about data shouldn't rely on narrow constructs like categories of data. So the US has a history of regulation that's sectoral, um, and I think that's fine, but, but it doesn't hold up over time. And so what I would, uh, I would, well, so for example, with, with social credit scoring, which is super controversial, right, there's a wide array of non-financial signals that can be used to infer credit worthiness, including things like people who don't let their phone batteries run down, right? I mean, and so that's just an example of how data doesn't often fit into these nice categories. Uh, but I'll give you one more example. Uh, so how many people are wearing a Fitbit or an Apple Watch here? All right, good. How many of you actually use it for sleep tracking? Because that's the primary thing I use, right? To tell me how little I've slept the night before, so I feel good about that. Um, so a couple years ago, I woke up in the middle of the night because we'd had an earthquake. I was living in San Carlos at the time. So uh, it was a 4.7. And the next day, Fitbit published all this data about sleep disruption. And sure enough, people in Oakland woke up first, stayed up longest. People in San Francisco woke up next, didn't stay up as long. And so on and so forth down to San Jose. Well, it turned out that that earthquakes epicenter was on the Hayward Fault just outside of Oakland. And so Fitbit had inadvertently created a seismic detection tool with their, with their device. Um, now it's not precise, but it's just one example of data that's being collected for one purpose that has, that gives you insights into a lot of things that you didn't quite expect. Um, and I think increasingly with AI, we need to expect that, um, that those sorts of things will be more commonplace. Um, and third, I think we need to think hard about data minimization um, and how we achieve that. So when I worked at Yahoo, uh, all the search engine companies were asked, you know, how long do you keep search data? 
And we all kind of went, for as long as it's useful. Uh, and I think actually the media sort of thought we were kind of doing this, like, hey, everybody, like, you know, screw you. We weren't, actually. It was lit, I mean, well, I don't know about Google because I worked at Yahoo at the time, so I'm not sure what the intent there was. But I know for, for sure what we were thinking is, this data has value and we're loath to delete it because we're not sure what benefit we're, we're foregoing with the deletion of this data. And again, these are all about trade-offs. Uh, but I, I hosted a, a round table with Brad Smith at Microsoft and we were having this conversation around, this is like a core tenant of, of, of FIPS effectively, is this idea of data minimization. And in the era of AI and machine learning, I just asked the question, how are we going to deal with that, uh, that issue? So I'm not saying that we shouldn't, I'm just saying we need to be thoughtful about it because what we do know with AI is that it's not always about big data, it's about sometimes small data, as long as you have the right data, is good enough, but how do we know what the right small data is? And so there are a lot of companies that are very, very, very reluctant uh, to move to a, a more extreme data minimization model. So I would say let's think more closely about that. And finally, on this topic of privacy, uh, getting back to the notion of consent fatigue, I would just ask what is meaningful consent anymore? Um, I know that cookie consent screens have gotten us to the point where we're just sort of clicking and moving along because we're like it's such an annoyance because it takes up half of the screen. But we hang our hat on putting the onus on consumers to make decisions. And when you think about our our own knowledge base around how technology works. I mean, I testified before Congress 10 years ago, and then I tuned in last year, and it's clear that Congress's knowledge level has not increased dramatically on technology, uh, but, the, but, but technology has dramatically become, I mean, I don't know how quantum computing works, uh, but be, imagine having to ask a, a consumer to give consent around something like that. How can I ever give meaningful consent. I think the notion of proxies uh, uh, in that model might be the solution, but we cannot simply live in a world where we're hanging our hat on, well, they said it's okay, so we can do this thing, because they don't know. They don't know. And that's only going to get worse. So these are some examples that I've described for you that we need to really consider. And I know I was being an optimist and that sounds kind of pessimistic, but I do believe that these are problems that we will have to solve. Now the other, the other thing I'll, I'll wrap with is that we need to also have a conversation around ethics um, in this space. Uh, so there are more and more companies that are creating departments of ethics or ethical leadership within their ranks. Um, and it's, you know, we used to have the conversation around do you build it or not build it, but I think we also need to have the conversation about are we responsible for how it's used. So if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., you take the elevator up to the third floor to start, and one of the first exhibits is about IBM. Um, and, and how their tools were used by the Nazis to catalog who was Jewish in World War II, or before World War II, in fact. And I think, you know, that happened a long time ago, but we're still not really having a, a, a conversation about the use of technology, not just the development of it. Um, and I think that's something that we very much need to think about. Now, there are some centers. The, uh, in Santa Clara University, there's a great organization called the Merkula Center. Uh, and they're, I think, the only applied ethics center that I'm aware of. Um, and they are overwhelmed with requests from tech companies to help them think about development and um, sales cycles and executive decision making on, on ethics. Um, there's a hunger for it. I know that there are a lot of people who think that it's kind of ethics washing. It's not for real. Um, I think it is for real. I just think it's early. Um, and many organizations don't know how to organize it. They don't know where to put it. They don't know what to call it. I mean, it's not new in companies. There are a lot of companies, especially in the health and medical fields that have grappled with this. But in, in tech, it's particularly in software, it's, it's kind of new for a lot of us. When I joined Yahoo in 1998, they didn't know where to put me. I was the very first fully dedicated privacy person in any internet company. And do you know where I reported? I reported into surfing. 
Um, and I reported into the surfing department because the head of the surfing department, because it was the directory at that time, she interned for Mark Rotenberg at Epic when the most vital privacy conversation was around caller ID, right? So she just had an interest in it and that's where I kind of sat in that organization. So I think what you're seeing right now is a lot of companies trying to do the right thing and trying to figure out how to give it meaningful teeth, how to develop processes around it, how to be transparent externally, um, but more importantly, how to be authentic to your own employees. So. This part of my talk is finale, so we're almost there. Um, I've laid out this utopian world. I've given some suggestions. I don't have perfect solutions. Um, when I was at the forum, we hosted a room full of UN ambassadors, and one of them, after hearing all of this talk about the, the transformational nature of technology, he raised his hand. He's like, where is the pause button? How do I make it stop? And I said, there is no pause button. Uh, you can't put the brakes on technology. We have to accelerate our response. And yet I remain optimistic. Um, I, I'm going to embarrass my kid. My kid, I talked about my kid, he's in my bio, he's here. Um, over winter break, my son and I went to northern Sweden because there isn't enough snow in Boulder, so we went north. Um, we went to go see the northern lights because it was on my bucket list. Uh, we stopped in Stockholm uh, for a couple days and we literally walked right by Greta Thunberg, literally walked right by her and she was on her 72nd week of her climate strike on her 17th birthday, okay? And I was at Davos when she wagged the finger at all of the, the billionaires there. It's incredibly inspiring for me to see how younger people have become activists on the environment, gun control, and yes, on privacy. They're a lot smarter about it than the rest of us. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that the messes that we have made with the environment or technology should only be left to Gen Z to fix. I, someone already said, okay, Boomer, you can call me Karen, whatever you like on that. No one gets that joke. All right, whatever, go look it up. Um, but if optimism and pessimism are defined by Merriam-Webster ab about the future, then I am an optimist. I really am an optimist. Um, it may be the case that, the darkest bef that it is currently the darkest before the dawn, but the potential is too great for us to give up on the sun, all right? So that's my talk, thank you. <laughs> and I think I've used all my time. I don't think there is actually any time remaining for questions, but I will be drinking wine at the reception, so I welcome uh, a, a continued conversation with any of you, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the first day of programming. Uh, tomorrow there will be breakfast at 8, and then we will pick right back up at 8.45 with our first keynote. Um, as of right now, there is the celebration for Silicon Flatiron's 20th anniversary at the Byron White Club level at Folsom Field. You're all invited to join us, and there should be parking available in the Folsom parking garage. From there, just follow the signs. Uh, if any of you are from out of town and are looking for carpools, we will be trying to set up a few of those if you just kind of mingle around in the lobby and look for students who might be driving. So thank you, and we hope to see you over there. <laughs>